three, going out. The Republican National Convention convenes again this evening here in Cleveland with acts such as Texas Senator Ted Cruz, Donald Trump's son Eric, Vice Presidential nominee Mike Pence, and another expected appearance by the nominee himself. Trump made his return to the big C by a helicopter in typically Trumpian grand fashion this afternoon. Last night, we heard from two of the Trump children, Tiffany and Donald Jr., after their father officially secured his party's presidential nomination. It was a strong finish to an otherwise rocky day that had been utterly consumed by headlines related to Melania Trump's Monday night speech. Today, more than 24 hours after Trump campaign officials and allies began implausibly insisting that her speech involved no plagiarism whatsoever, Trump world reversed course. They put out a statement from a woman named Meredith McIver, a staff writer at the Trump Organization, who accepted responsibility for copying language from Michelle Obama's 2008 convention address. McIver said she had offered yesterday to resign, but that offer had been rejected by the Trumps. As for the Donald himself, he's not shying away from this controversy anymore. After silence yesterday, today, he tweeted, quote, Good news is Melania's speech got more publicity than any in the history of politics, especially if you believe that all press is good press, exclamation point. Meanwhile, today we're seeing the first real signs of tension between protesters and the police here in Cleveland. This was the scene just a short while ago right behind us here outside the entrance to the Quicken Loans Arena. Things have calmed down since then and the gates to the queue are back open. Mark. Uh, going back to Melania Gate, Melania Michelle plagiarism gate, uh, after the statements, the tweets, all the stuff that's happened, and the pretty well-reviewed speeches by at least a couple people last night, have the Trumps successfully, to use the reigning cliche, turn the pitch? The press loves to cover negativity, and the meme right now is the Trump campaign's incompetent. Uh, the way they handled the plagiarism incident, uh, the way the, the, the first two sessions ended with speakers who did not hold the crowd in the hall from 10.30 to about 11. And um, they need to break that meme. I, they have enough based on last night. I think they're in position. It's been said now, as the press starts to realize the first two and a half days don't really matter. If Donald Trump and Ivanka give speeches tomorrow night that are good, I think they will leave here with a successful convention and regain some of their needed reputation for being more competent. I'll say one last thing. They've been very competent at squelching the Stop Trump movement. Very I think good. they put so, many, so much they emphasis did. on they that. They forgot about everything they else. They forgot about a lot of yeah, other things. Look, I mean, there's no reason why, given the Meredith MacGyver thing, there's no reason that statement couldn't come out 24 hours ago and they would have not had to lie and seemed ridiculous and said, oh, there was no plagiarism here for 24 hours. They made fools of themselves and they could have shut the thing down they burnished, instantly. They burnished their reputation for not running the tight ship. Totally. And that's not good for those people, many of whom we know, who worry that the Trump incompetence will have a real price in terms of how this campaign gets run. So say that is true. The other thing we both agree on, it's weird, this thing of the last half hour of convention nights, two nights in a row, having, coming after the highlights, people streaming out the doors, empty seats, people all over the country wondering like, wait, isn't the thing supposed to end with like a bang? Not happening. Those are both weird things, but I will say, all that matters, and it's been true since day one, I think, is that what happens on Thursday night? You know, all of the rest of the stuff, Mike Murphy said to me today, we had a conversation, he said it's all about putting up, for all this is for three days is putting a frame around the picture. The picture is going to be Trump's speech. If the picture is great, the convention will be remembered well. If the speech is not great, it will be remembered poorly, and all the rest of this stuff will not matter because the frame isn't what you look at. I have indications that he's working harder on this than he has on almost anything else he's done in this campaign. And if he does, if that's true, and if he executes, and I just I'll keep bringing up Ivanka because I think her speech is so important. Right. If if those two execute, then I think that he leaves here with the head of steam. Their challenges, the Democrat, the Democrat vice presidential pick and convention are coming right up, but they are now in a position after last night and after today, I think, to do what they need to do, which is frame it up for him. Yeah, I get. I mean, look, uh, I think there's going to be. For a lot of people who are, because the party is divided still, there are still going to be, when we get out of here, this will be a Rashomon painting. There will be people who, for the rest of our lives, talk about this is the worst Republican convention of their lives. And if Donald Trump goes on and wins the presidency, there will be people who say, this is the beginning of a revolution. All you naysayers are totally wrong. You know, uh, I don't know about, about whether work, whether the, 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 the result of a great convention speech is just because of how much effort you put in. Effort's obviously important, but we've known others who put a lot of effort in and come up short. So we'll see whether those guys can actually do something. It's going to require, though, for Trump to do what he needs to do, which is appeal to a broader bunch of people, overcome big structural advantages. He's got to give a really good speech on Thursday night. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. You've got to come at this convention and execute competence because the press is looking above all else 
to be theater critics and political consultants and say they could do it better. Yeah. All right, one of the most closely watched speech this evening at the Q is going to be for sure the speech of Texas Senator Ted Cruz. Granting a vanquished rival for the presidency who has refused to endorse the nominee a primetime speaking slot is unusual to say the least. In some ways, we think it's unprecedented. This morning, Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort had this preview of Cruz's appearance. We've been talking back and forth of what the senator wants to say. I'll see a copy of the speech later this morning uh, because he's still working on it. Uh, I'm comfortable that uh, Senator Cruz is going to talk about his vision for America. It'll be campaign themes that he's talked about in the campaign. I think that uh, he'll talk about you know Hillary Clinton and uh, and the failures of how America cannot afford to have Hillary Clinton president. And I think he'll say something. But he'll, he'll give a sign of where he is on Donald Trump that will be pleasing to the, the Trump campaign and to the Republicans. Over the last several weeks, Cruz has been pretty quiet publicly. Behind the scenes, he and his operation are building a robust political network, and they've spent some time thanking his delegates and other supporters at an event earlier this afternoon here in Cleveland, where he didn't say he'd endorse Trump, didn't mention Trump by name. Instead, he was talking about the future of his grassroots efforts when, once again, Trump stole the show. Our party now has a nominee. And I don't know. Uh, Je Jeff, did you email them to fly the plane right when I said that? So amidst the reports that uh, Cruz and Trump have talked in the last 24 hours, big question, the Trump campaign has been pretty aggressive with people who've not shown support for Trump, yeah. and yet they're letting Ted Cruz speak in prime time. Why is that? Well, look, I, there are Republicans uh, that I've been talking to all week who think that if this were a genuinely open convention, it would nominate Ted Cruz. And, and there's a lot of Cruz support out there on the floor. I mean, more than any, for anybody else other than Donald Trump. I, I think, you know, if Paul Manafort is serious and understands, as he obviously does, that unifying the party is important, to squelch Ted Cruz, the, the runner-up, and someone who has this much support on the floor of this convention to say, no, we're not going to give you a speaking slot, especially once they've already taken care of the genuine threat to Trump's nomination, it would be crazy politically not to let the guy talk. I mean, they need his people. You know, he has clearly put in place more things than anyone else, including John Kasich, the other guy who's eyeing 2012 in a pretty aggressive way. 2020. In 2020. And he's, and he's got his grassroots support and the fundraising capacity. Yeah. So Ted Cruz, if Donald Trump loses, will, will be in a, a great position. And I think he's clearly learned some lessons. I, I still, I see, I see why he's playing the game he's playing. I still don't see why he's getting a speaking slot. And I don't understand, given that they did just talk, why the two sides couldn't negotiate something. Now, that having been said, based on, again, some indications I'm picking up, I wouldn't be surprised if he endorses him tonight. Well, we know there's reporting, Eliana Johnson, our friend, as says no endorsement. Um, people who are interested just generally in Cruz's ambition should go to our site and read the story uh, by Steve Asino and Sasha Eisenberg about what Tr Cruz's game is, how he's positioning himself as uh, Reagan in 76. Um, those are all, there's a lot of interesting reporting going on about this and what Cruz's game is here. As I said, I think, you know, it's a sign of graciousness and bigness, I think, and the fact that they won the important battle, which is, He's the nominee now, and he can afford to allow a genuine conservative voice. As long as Cruz doesn't attack him on the floor, he doesn't co it doesn't cost him anything to let this happen. Dirty little secret about 2016 is no one really started early and built grassroots in the early states. That's one reason Trump was able to win. Totally. Cruz got a base to build from. If he starts early, it may be hard to catch him. Well, and he'll be able to make that perennial argument that, like, we didn't nominate a real conservative if he loses in 2016, yeah. and he is the real conservative. Yeah. All right, as Donald Trump's running mate, Mike Pence, prepares to take the stage tonight at the queue, Hillary Clinton is in the final stretch of her own VP deliberations. Two national newspapers ran beep stake story this is this morning. Washington Post reporting that there are two contenders at the very top of Clinton's shortlist, Secretary of Agriculture and former Iowa Governor Tom Vilsack and former Virginia Governor and current Virginia Senator Tim Kaine. The New York Times reported that Clinton is emphasizing foreign policy and national security experience in her decision calculus, which may put retired four-star Navy Admiral James Stavridis in the mix as well. Clinton hasn't made any decisions yet, obviously, and there are still other names being floated and considered, but Mark, if it is down 
to Kane and Bill Sack, who are the two consistent names between both the Post and the Times, and I think consistent in some of our reporting, too. Which one is the best choice for her just on the politics, just on the politics? Doesn't matter. Right. No, neither of them is going to have a huge political upside. They both will make the base happy. They both have some sort of centrist appeal. They're both good campaigners. They're both decent fundraisers. I, I think that, that Hillary Clinton is, is running a paradigmatic search. She's looking for someone who's qualified to be president, who she'd like to govern with, and who will do no harm politically. And as best I can tell, neither of those guys, they're named dimes worth the difference between them in terms of all the things that matter. I think she'd be best picking the one who she'd be happiest announcing. I mean, people say that Kane has the national security experience because of the fact that he's on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I think um, when, we may we may be in agreement when, that that is not that is not actual. When Tom Vilsack was commander in chief of the Iowa National, <laughs> national Guard, Guard, there was not Equals. a single incursion right. Right. over the border with Minnesota right. or Wisconsin. Yeah, I know we're saying the same great. thing. Yeah. We're saying the same thing. It's they are they are both too. You know, Vilsack's a little further to the left, but he's not like some big hero of the left. Uh, Kane's a little more in the middle. There might be some Sanders voters who are upset. Donald Trump, by making the choice he made in, 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 in picking Pence, gave Hillary Clinton a big wide latitude here. Because if he picked, Chris, if he picked Christie or picked Gingrich, you'd have two guys who could be pyrotechnic on a debate stage, right? And she'd have to think about, who am I going to have to go up against those guys in the daily news cycle and on that debate stage with Pence? He's fine, but he's not going to like be a monster on the debate stage. She can go with solid kind of white bread and pick one of those two guys. It takes a lot of pressure off her. I'm interested in the optics of how they do this, the timing. Do they do it Friday? Do they do it Saturday? Leak it Friday? Step on the convention? Whatever. That's going to be an interesting thing to watch. All right. When we come back, Senator from Arkansas, Tom Cotton, joins us right here, right after this. Welcome back to Cleveland. Our next guest gave a primetime speech here at the convention on Monday night. Senator from the great state of Arkansas, Tom Cotton. Senator, thanks for joining us. I am sick of hearing you asked, and I'm sure you're sick of answering the question of where you stand on Donald Trump. You've been asked all the time. People try to sort of get you to admit the truth. So let me just ask you this. How's the convention going? Forget that you're nominee. How's the convention I'm, going? I'm having a lot of fun at the convention. I think it's been going pretty well. Uh, as we were talking just earlier, you know, this is the first time the Republican Party of Arkansas has ever been a majority party. Party coming into a convention, so our delegation is very excited. Um, so I think it's been a great week so far. Evaluate how the convention has gone from the point of view of uniting the party behind Donald Trump. 
I, I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, I think coming out of this week, we're going to be largely united, if not entirely. Um, and that's important because in the end, you know, a united party is not enough. Republicans don't make up a majority in this country any more than do Democrats. We've got to come out of here ready to appeal to moderates, to independents, and even disaffected Democrats. It won't change. Mark's tired of asking you the question about Trump, but I'm not yet, at least. I, mean, I know you've been you've been a little I, I, evasive, is the word, maybe? Not like telling why, I, 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 without asking you what your position is, because obviously you don't really want to say, why are you being so, like, lack of, why are you exhibiting such lack of clarity on this question? Well, I, mean, I spoke at the convention that has nominated Donald Trump. He's right. now I, our nominee, and right. I've said all along that I would support the nominee. I support the Trump-Pence ticket. I think a Republican president and a Republican Congress will make for a safer and more prosperous America than with Hillary Clinton in the White House or Democrats in control of the Congress. So that seems like a pretty wholehearted endorsement, <laughs> right? Is there, you know, you're, you're like, you're all for these guys. That's right? the, you know, that's the choice we have. Um, and uh, I believe, again, that with uh, Donald Trump and Mike Pence in the White House, Republicans in control of the Senate. As I said Monday night, yeah. help is going to be on the way for our troops, but I also think help will be on the way for all Americans. Beyond, beyond your own speech, what have you seen in the last two days that you think successfully does what you just talked about, which is to appeal to a broader group than just the Republican base? What's, what have they done so you far know, that's I, expanded I, the coalition? I actually think the Trump family has done a very good job of introducing Donald to a broader audience, telling a, a, maybe a different side than they see in the news, Melania's speech, and then the speech of... Uh, Donald Trump Jr. and Tiffany last night. I suspect that'll continue tonight with Ivanka and with Eric's speech as well. As you look at the Clinton campaign, what are they doing that's smart? Um, hard, to, hard for me to say, <laughs> but uh, you know, tough polls for Secretary Clinton. Yeah. They may have a technically proficient campaign. They may be able to slice and dice the voters into different segments. They may have a great turnout operation, but if you don't have a candidate that motivates people to go vote, sometimes it's hard to take. So who get a horse to drink water if you even if you take the water? Who do you make the favorite in the race then, Trump or Clinton? Um, right now, I think it's probably a toss-up. Um, I mean, this is certainly going to be a, a race unlike anything we've seen in our adult lifetimes. Um, but I think the American people want change right now, and that if we make the case as Republicans that we're going to bring the kind of change they need, if we are in fact going to get the economy working. For working folks again, if we're going to make America safe again, then in the end, the uh, American people are going to vote for Donald Trump for the presidency, and they're going to vote for Republicans in the Senate and the House. Not sure we'll get a chance to talk to you before uh, your nominee's acceptance speech tomorrow. So, what does Donald Trump need to do in the speech tomorrow to achieve whatever goals he need he has? I think you know he he needs to to lay out the case, much of which he's laid out in the uh, primaries and and since the primaries, the Republican Party is going to speak to the everyday practical anxieties and concerns of the vast middle class, working class, and working poor. That we're going to get the economy moving again, we're going to get people back into jobs, we're going to get wages increasing in those jobs, and that we're going to make people safe on the streets here in uh, America, and that we're also going to uh, help address the chaotic situation around the world. When you showed up at our uh, at our location here today, you had to walk through a protest. Um, there was a vice deal activity out there, SWAT teams, some stuff going on out there. Uh, earlier in the week, Paul Manafort said if there's unrest at the convention, Donald Trump will benefit politically. Do you think that's true? Well, I don't think there's been much unrest. I mean, obviously, there was a protest. I, I think protests typically happen at most conventions. Uh, but I was, I was just remarking earlier today to an Arkansas reporter just how minimal the security disruptions have well, been. Still, we haven't seen that many We're still protesters. only halfway through. But do you think Manafort's right? If there's significant unrest, does Donald Trump benefit politically? Well, not just at the at the RNC or here in Cleveland. I, I think as we see a rising crime wave around our country, we see police officers being assassinated by racist cop killers, the Republicans, as the party of law and order, the party that believes in backing the blue and keeping violent felons in prison where they belong, the American people are going to turn to the party that believes in being tough on crime, not the party the Democrats are, which is being soft on crime. How, how do you feel about trying to stop a, 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 a kind of a pseudo Arkansan from getting to the White House? Well, she's very much a pseudo Arkansan. Yeah. How so? <laughs> so I don't think Hillary's done a press conference in, what, nine or ten months? Yeah. That's kind of how she treated Arkansans for 16 years. Really? She was not available to you when you were there? I would not say that she had a large public persona or there's a deep well, what there's is, a deep reservoir of warm feelings for Hillary Clinton What did you Arkansas. think of the Clintons as you were growing up? You know, I was 15 by the time he was elected president, so I didn't have much of an impression other than just the fact that they were... But did, as, our a, as a 15-year-old, did you have pride in the fact that an Arkansan was in yeah, the White so that's, I mean, that was about the time in my life when I started reading the news as opposed to just reading the sports pages in the newspaper. And mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was kind of neat that my, go my governor was running for president and got elected to president and was president. And then I realized what he believed, and I thought, I must be a Republican. Have you seen Lou Holtz since he got here? I have not. Uh, he's around. He's, he's a great speaker. Yeah, he is a great speaker.
All right. All right. Senator, thank you. Good to Thanks, see you. Guys. You're nice Good to stop by. Yep. All right, coming up next, two people who are going to take us deep inside the Trump family, Trump advisor and a Trump attorney and friend right after this. Joining us now in Cleveland is Executive Vice President of the Trump Organization and Special Counsel to the man himself, Michael Cohen. Also with us, the Senior Advisor to the Trump Campaign, Kellyanne Conway, who has some news. Huh. I have none. I am not. I believe, I believe from what one person told me that Cruz, Ted Cruz is going to surprise endorse Trump at the convention tonight in his speech. I asked Kellyanne to confirm it. And I she said declined, I cannot. She declined, I declined with her mouth. You know, you keep this up, I'm yeah. telling you, I like yeah. the name of Cohen and Conway okay. as a new Senator. show. We could easily <laughs> replace the you, two of you. you. To, for the record, because you're not a leaker, uh, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't like affirmatively confirm it. But your lack of confirmation told me everything I need to know. I just don't know. I think you have to wait for the <laughs> really? speaches. The speeches tonight are really terrific. Kelly, your eyes right now are confirming <laughs> it. What are you talking? What are you like? Why, why There's play no these way games? for me to confirm. I'm not in a position to confirm that. Really? Michael oh, Cohen, your goodness. position to confirm it? I'm not in a position either. Is that because you've been in Italy recently? That's correct. Okay. All right, what would be in it for Senator Cruz to surprise endorse? You're not confirming his, but if he did, like, why would that be a good thing? Hypothetically, if yeah. he did, party unity, um, showing that he, agree, he agrees with the will of the people, that he is supporting his pledge to support the Republican nominee, right. making good his pledge when others aren't. I saw no footnote in the pledge. I saw no codicil in the pledge. I've seen the pledge. <laughs> and, uh, and certainly, just to... And just to move forward, I think, as a party, and between that and Paul Ryan's speech last night, Speaker Ryan's speech last night, and the fact that Speaker Ryan is introducing Mike Pence tonight, right. I think you are starting to see not who's not at the convention, but who is and, and we, what it means for should, Donald Trump. We should say for the six viewers of ours who don't know, you worked for the uh, constellation of Ted Cruz Super PACs. I did. And you know him quite well. So your description of why he might endorse tonight could represent a window into why he is going to endorse tonight. I'll give you one more chance to That's get, another hypothetical. I mean, he okay. really should. He yeah. really should. They asked everyone who was going to make the pledge that they would, you know, back the Republican nominee. They all raised their hands. Yeah. Right? You certainly remember that because Mr. Trump took a tremendous amount of heat uh, because he wouldn't raise his hand. Well, you know what? They have to honor their pledge. If they want to be 
politicians and they want people to trust them, the least you could do is honor your pledge. And the other and thing is Ted Cruz is here, right? I mean, this word endorsement, obviously standing up at the convention, it's Donald Trump's convention, it feels like Donald Trump's convention next week in Philly, it will not feel like Hillary Clinton's convention as much. And, and he is coming and he is speaking. And what did Trump and Cruz do together in a field of 17 talented people? They won the gold and the silver. Together, they ran against the establishment. That's clearly where the Republican primary and caucus electorate went. And I think Trump, and Cruz helps to buttress and back up the, the core Trump message, which is it's a rigged, corrupt system. It benefits insiders. Nobody confuses Ted Cruz with being an insider in Washington. And I think Ted Cruz can also make the case for conservatism and bring conservatives between Cruz and Pence, bring reluctant conservatives around. Really, the, the whatever remnants of the Never Trump remain uh, should really feel very marginalized, if not silenced. After well, that's right, because at the end Cruz's of the day, appearance. if you want to see change in Washington. And if you want to see things actually get done, Ted Cruz could be a lot of help in Washington when Mr. Trump becomes the president. Guys, I want to, I want to be like a normal American here right now for a second and not like a political insider. Um, if, if, given that Mr. Trump suggested that Ted Cruz's father was involved in the Kennedy assassination and retweeted like a kind of really unflattering photograph of Ted Cruz's wife, both of which infuriated Ted Cruz and everyone around him, just put yourself in Ted Cruz's shoes. How could you bring yourself to endorse someone who did that to you? How could Bernie Sanders go ahead and endorse Hillary Clinton? How could any politician who's going through this process— None of those this process is ugly by nature. And at the end of the day, you have to acknowledge it's ugly Michael, by nature. It was ugly between Barack Obama none of them and accused, Hillary Clinton. None of them accused anybody's parents well, of assassinating JFK. By the way, he didn't accuse anybody. It was done in an article, and he retweeted it. Okay. That doesn't mean that he's endorsing it. didn't mean that he created it. All he did is retweet it. And I think you guys read way too much in retweets. Well, I, it's not really me reading it in. I just want to tell you, it was Senator Cruz and all the people around Senator Cruz who felt that it was coming from Because they were Trump. looking to not try me. to not him off a pedestal to gain momentum for themselves, which they just right. never But the decision did. to move on guys, 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 that guys. Is, is Senator Cruz's decision. We have, a, we have a hard break. we got to go. Kellyanne and Michael, stay with us. We'll be right back after this quick break. Back in Cleveland with Donald Trump's longtime special counsel, his friend Michael Cohn, and his senior advisor, Kellyanne Conway, who also is a friend of the Trumps and the Trump family. I want to ask you, the family is so influential, great family, very close, vacation together, but they're now playing key roles, including Jared, Mr. Trump's son-in-law, and you can't fire your family. Have they put, has Mr. Trump put himself in a First position? First of all, that's not true. You can fire and your family? I've been in the office yeah. several times yeah. when Mr. Trump said to the children, 
no one's job here is written in stone except for mine. So that's so if he not, decides, that's if he not decides 100% Jared, If he true. decides Jared Kushner's not doing a good job, he'll say, Jared, you're fired? I think he would just say, hey, Jared, why don't you take a <laughs> step to the side? But fortunately for Mr. Trump, that situation is not going to happen. I'm not Jared is just yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. Ivanka, Don, Eric, Tiffany, yeah. even Barron. I'm, I mean, they I'm, are. I'm not saying they're doing a bad job, but are you? do you believe that if he will evaluate their performance going forward the way he would as if they weren't related, and if they're not doing as good a job as someone else, he'd get rid of them? 100%. And that for a pollster, that's. That's very Top high. of the line, yeah. Yeah. and the reason What's that the we know that is, even as a mother, I know who's tougher Plus on their own. Three. Who's tougher on their own kids than their own parents, and it's true. And I think one thing you heard from Don Jr. last night, you'll hear from Ivanka tomorrow, you'll hear perhaps Eric say, is that they know him as a father, but they also know him as a mentor and as almost a colleague. In other words, as the boss, that gives you an entirely different perspective into someone. And I can't believe that how, how just how well they're all doing in their inaugural political outing. I mean, it's unbelievable how. How many billions of dollars are spilled over consultants and messaging and this one and that one, and yet they're doing it based on their understanding of the cultural zeitgeist that led up to this moment, their gut, and their understanding of that man, Donald Trump, their father, mentor, and boss, how that fits with where our nation is now and what their wish list is for the next president. And Donald well, Trump is a totally result-oriented individual. Wow. And at the end of the day, the end of the day, if they're not doing the right job, he will push them to the side, and he will bring somebody in that will bring him the result that he wants. Let us speak to results orientation. You work at the Trump Organization. You I know Ms. McIver, right? I do. Okay, so um, it, she, she wrote a speech. It was a lovely speech. Uh, Melania Trump gave it really well. She got a lot of attention. And then the next day, it turned out that a really like dumb thing had happened. No, not suggesting there was anything malicious in what McIver did. 40 words out of 2,000. I, I understand. You guys want to say it's, but it consumed. But it is 40 words out of Consumed 2000. a huge number of news cycles, and she apologized for it and offered a resignation. So clearly, she thought something that she had and mr trump mr trump graciously did not accept her resignation Why? because she's a very good woman right. and she's been with him for a long time and while everybody in life makes mistakes that doesn't mean that you end it right there there's too many years and she's really a good person she cares about not just mr trump the right. trump organization everything that she puts out is has always been just top notch she made a mistake. Sure. She owned it. And you know what? Mr. Trump is actually a very decent human being. And he. And and he and so, he's, so he's results oriented, except in these instances where he's. Where he's oh, a I don't know. Human no, being. No, oh, that, I don't that, know. I don't know if that's car. If that that's car. completely consistent. Look, Let me ask you, many in the media tried to as, tried to crucify Melania Trump and whoever helped her with her speech. And what what happened in the reverse was we got a window into Donald Trump and the way he handles different situations. Let me ask you this question. With grace and with fairness. I mean, what you're saying just, is that you. You drop an angle on somebody's head I, simply I'm because not, that, there's, suggest that there's an error. There's an honest I, mistake. Let me ask you this question, though. So why couldn't the thing that happened today have happened 24 hours ago and saved you guys 24 hours of grief? The letter from oh, her, I think the, the, news I, the news cycle just took over. I mean, right. once oh. something comes out with the letter with, she wrote, with, could, have been, she could have been written and released yesterday. So why did that not happen? Why did, why did it take Hillary Clinton until 5 p.m. to comment on the Baton Rouge uh, you, police ambush? Uh, no, I mean, seriously. You're, you're not, you, no, Kellyanne, no, that's not really the answer question. to my question. Well, first of all, you're going to have to ask people question. who are involved with that. But you know what the voters are going to remember? They're going to remember that Melania Trump stood up and said the greatest privilege on planet Earth is to be in America. American citizen. I'm glad to be spending my 10th anniversary next week doing that. That my, my husband is strong. He loves his country. He's made sacrifices. He's running for the right reasons. They're not going to remember who in the media wanted to destroy Melania Trump and, and her family over this and, and this woman who's been a loyal and, I guess, effective She's employee a wonderful, of the wonderful Trump person. organization. So I don't think the voters are really going to care about that. I would, I would love to hear what you guys said if the exact same thing happened in Hillary Clinton's convention, if the exact same situation you guys would have said. Hillary no Clinton has, no, Hillary yeah, Clinton I would has have, had and I'll issues of plagiarism. So has Barack Obama. So has... Um, she might think uh, of getting back to that, by the way. Her speeches have been pretty flat recently. But okay. um, but but the fact let, is, no, let, I would not have made a big deal because I can't believe we see breaking news, Nice, 84 dead. Breaking news, Orlando, 49 innocent people dead. Breaking news, Melania Trump's speech. With this outsized nonsense that we place on things that the voters don't say are important to them, we're not going to see that reflect in the ballot box. They're going to remember that, that they're going to remember that this was Donald Trump's convention. That the entire family spoke, that they weighed in, and that there was a woman who has the affection of her husband, has great affection for the United States of America. Kellyanne Conway, thank you. Michael Cohen, welcome back to America and to your first convention. Thank you very we much. We look forward to hearing what you think of the circus that goes on inside there across the street <laughs> in a positive way. Up next, what David Plouffe said about Donald Trump's chances in November.
it will be to you, as they say, uber interesting. And if you're watching us in Washington, D.C., you can also listen to us anytime on the radio radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We'll be right back. the nominee unconventionally. He may make this close. I don't think he has a chance to win. That was David Plouffe, senior vice president at Uber, one of our favorite companies, and one of the key figures, of course, behind Barack Obama's election and re-election, talking about Donald Trump at a Bloomberg Politics lunch panel today. As the Republican nominee gears up for the general election, a pro-Trump super PAC, Rebuilding America Now, announced its first major advertising push on the nominee's behalf. With us now, is the head of that group and former campaign manager for Chris Christie, Ken McKay, to my left, and also our old friend Alex Castellanos, an advisor to that same pack over here on Mark's right. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Um, tell us what you guys are doing. Well, we're getting ready to run some ads here against Hillary Clinton to make sure she's not the next president of the United States. Um, so we, we were hitting donors up and going around having our meetings. and. Alex is doing the creative on it. We've got a couple ads in the can. We've got a 60 that started today, I think, which is a more positive, uh, you know, Trump piece. Trump in his own words sort of thing about his vision for America's future and what's important here. He's the only president, he's the only candidate for president, pardon me, that's going to put America first. And uh, then next week, probably more traditionally, start hitting Hillary and reminding folks, you know, keep her underwater, who she really is. We're going to ask you guys in a minute, I think, about like what, how it is to operate in this world of super PACs when you're not like really formally blessed by the Trump campaign and how much that would matter. But I want to ask you, what's Hillary Clinton's biggest vulnerability? What's going to be the heart of your advertising? Oh, I think if we can overcome her uh, warmth and her honesty uh, and get to the issues, maybe we can ding her there. No, I think she's got a credibility problem, you know, an honesty problem. She is a big, uh, she's big on the nine commandments. The tenth one is a little bit of an issue for Hillary Clinton. Uh, I was just in a focus group with Frank Luntz a couple of days ago, actually here in Cleveland, and when you ask for the one word that describes Hillary Clinton, a bunch of people said liar. That's a hard word to say in public in front of other people about anyone. I haven't heard it that big anywhere else in, in my career. Can she win if people still think that on election day? I think right now it's a race is a toss-up. I think either of these candidates could win, sure. 
Um, but at the end of the group, I asked Frank if he'd go in and ask him, scary change or no change? And the group was split, which tells you where this election is. That's how close this is. But I think it's much easier for Donald Trump to comfort people that, yes, change is disruptive, but we got to do it, as opposed to Hillary Clinton becoming something she's not at all. She is more the same. She's continuity. You know, if you thought Barack Obama eight years was too much, imagine him on the Supreme Court. She said that's a great idea. So there's a lot of, uh, the, if we make the case for continuity in a country with a 71% wrong track, right? 71% of Americans think this thing's heading the wrong direction. She's more of that. We can win this race. Last cycle, there, there were basically, there was a, a blessed Romney super PAC and a blessed Obama super PAC. Mr. Trump basically said, I don't like super PACs. I don't want one. There's, I, don't, I can't keep track of all the super PACs who say they are the Trump super PAC. You'd like to be the Trump super PAC, right? You'd like all the donors to say you're the one. Make the case that you are the one that any donor who wants to give to a super PAC to help Donald Trump should give to you. We are the super PAC. But, but well, how well, do you, we he's just, not blessed we, you, so how we do you just had, convince Well, I think that? the campaign has. I mean, I, I think, so? well, to the extent that it's permissible for them to kind of shower encouragement on our efforts. I think they have. We just had a meeting with a, with a, a room full of donors. Uh, Mr. Manafort gets been reported. Uh, Mr. Manafort called in and said that um, you know he it encouraged our efforts uh, to the extent legally permissible. I don't remember his exact wording on it. I'm sure there was a lawyer sitting next to him when he said it. But I think it's us. And 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 by the way, we're the one organized, spots in the can, ready to defeat Hillary Clinton. She's the worst thing to happen to this country. In she started. She's her and her team started. Uh, worse than know, Pokemon Go? Her and, much worse, because Pokemon Go is not lying to you. She started 24 years ago with I didn't inhale, and here we are now, a quarter century later, and it's I didn't email. This is never going to change. Anybody, lies, lies, lies. Paul. Anybody who says there's something worse than Pokemon Go is a liar. <laughs> I'll say it out loud on television. I asked, uh, I asked uh, Paul Manafort when he called in today, if he was calling any other super PACs, he said no. Uh, so how do you Governor his, Pence how do you has said one of the best ways... Uh, to uh, help Donald Trump and defeat Hillary Clinton is to help rebuilding America now. And he's, I think he's committed part of his schedule to attend events that uh, rebuilding America now so is you, going to have. So, so you so would say, based on those things, Manafort calling in, support from Governor, uh, Governor Pence, you would say that Donald Trump and his campaign no longer oppose being supported by a super PAC? I think uh, right now, when you're up against, you know, Hillary Clinton's going to be spending a billion bucks on this thing, and you have to fight fire with fire, and that's you, what but, we're going to do. But they, and if this wasn't the official, if this wasn't the, I think, let's say, most serious super PAC, I, I wouldn't want to be a part of it. Uh, I think we can make a difference here. But you consider yourself the blessing of the campaign? Um, I'm glad Governor Pence is going to be coming to our events and that Paul isn't calling any other super PACs today. Why is, that, why is this a political problem for Donald Trump? He spent the entirety of the nomination fight saying that super PACs were bad. He wasn't in the pocket of anybody. He was going to self-fund. This was why all of his, his rivals were corrupt because they were taking PAC money. And not that long ago, we had people from his campaign saying he will never bless a super PAC. He doesn't want super PACs involved. How is that not a political problem? Does it make him look like a hypocrite? Well, he's not taking the money we are. We're corrupt. He's still <laughs> Alex, why is he not a hypocrite? If he's blessed he can't, you now. Because he can't stop us from doing it. Well, we're that's, going that's to not do what it. you just said. That's not what you said. We're going that's to do it. You, that's not what you said. You said he blessed you. That's different from saying no, he can't I, stop I didn't you. say he blessed us. I you said, did. Alex, well, yeah. if I did, I, what, I did, what, did what did Paul call, Paul Manafort say when he called You have him? to play by the rules you're given here. And I think if we're going to, if we let Hillary Clinton run unchecked in these swing states, dumping a ton of negatives on Donald Trump all throughout this, this would be a much tougher Alex, race. We've got to keep the spotlight on her, and this is what it we're, takes. We're, and not it's a more... we're not challenging your right to run these ads. We're asking the question of how you square Donald Trump's previous opposition to this with now what you say is a tacit or explicit endorsement of what you're doing. Isn't that not hypocrisy on its face? He won the nomination, and now we're going to make America great again. Uh, okay, well, that was nice. and That was the, top, the most evasive thing how, I've ever heard How much are you going to raise by, the end of, by November? What's your goal? Oh, at least $120 million. That's what they've publicly booked right now. We can see $118 million. we got to get that plus more. And Paul Begala's running around. We've heard rumors he said he's going to raise 250 If he raises 250 we got to raise 250 Is Oregon a battleground state? I think, you know, most folks would understand that the key battleground states are going to be Florida, 
uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania. Is Oregon a battleground state? We're going to have to see. I don't. I, right now, I wouldn't put it top tier. Is Connecticut a battleground state? Not yet. All right. So I mean, so when Paul Manafort talks about those being battleground states, you guys think mm, he might that's be? That's the campaign. Well, that's the no, campaign. I don't, I'm not asking for your for evaluation efforts, of the campaign's views. For our efforts, I think as long as Donald Trump is close in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Florida, and maybe North Carolina, depending on the vice presidential pick, then jump ball. This is a race, and that's our mission. All right. Okay. Alex Castellanos, Ken McKay, you guys are both fantastic, awesome, and wonderful. <laughs> were we and sufficiently evasive? Yo, you guys were. You, for, for, you, you should have seen the last thing. It's, it's, hard, it's hard for two men who are quite so evasive to be quite so delightful. Well, people people want to know what's really going on. Go to rebuildingamericanow.com. See the spots there. Okay, there you go. You got the plug in. Coming up, <laughs> about last night, we'll be right back. Joining us now, Guardian columnist Jonathan Friedland, a keen observer, I'm calling you a keen observer of American politics. His latest dispatch from the, this convention is titled, The Targeting of Hillary Clinton Suggests a Vicious Campaign Ahead. Also with us, senior national reporter for Bloomberg Politics, Jennifer Jacobs, who wrote a piece today about Donald Trump Jr.'s political ambitions. Thank you both for coming. Jennifer, tell me your impressions of Donald Trump Jr.'s performance last night and his role in the campaign. Well, I would say that he kind of seemed intoxicated on be, about being on stage. He, he came on stage very calmly and then just really ramped up the excitement toward the, the end, and you could just tell he was loving it. And so um, at a breakfast this morning that The Wall Street Journal put on, he was asked about his political ambitions, and he said, listen, I've got five kids. Perhaps once my kids are out of school. But he also said, listen, as a patriot, I would, this is something I would like to consider. And I was sitting next to people in the room who know him very well, and they were elbow me, elbowing me, saying he really would love to run for office someday, and he'd be brilliant. Which your impressions of him? I, I thought the same, that he looked much more like a professional politician, actually, than his father. And what was extraordinary was he was so confident with the teleprompter and delivering a conventional political speech that he was actually better at that than the, some of the professional polls that had gone before, who often had very sort of uh, halting or faltering delivery. He looked as if he'd been doing this a long time. I agree, he looked like he enjoyed it. But what struck me as odd was he fit the profile of a conventional politician much more than his father. And so a he kind of a different figure. And a conventional conservative. 
Yeah, in turn, well, and he also talked about policy, which let's face it, nobody else had, and his father doesn't do much of. He actually, did, I mean, he didn't go deep into it, but there was something there you could bite on, and it was had structure. Yeah. It was written. It wasn't just a ramble. And so he, you know, it was Trump 2.0. And he well, talked this morning about how he doesn't like talking points and how yeah, most politicians just seem like they have marbles in their mouth if, if they get off of their talking points. And so he was criticizing someone, a former campaign aide, and being very blatant about it. It was it was unusual to see someone doing that. So. Um, I, the, one of the, among the many weird things in this convention, things I never thought I'd hear or see, is people who walk around uh, and say things like, the reason Donald Trump could win this election is a thing called Brexit. Um, and, and it gets cited all the time. So yeah. both to explain why the polls aren't showing up, more that Trump is, why, yes. to explain why the polls seem mysterious, other things. You live in Britain. You follow yes. Brexit a lot. Do you see parallels between the Trump phenomenon and the Brexit phenomenon? Well, the, the big parallel is that it's broken any kind of comfort people might have had from data and polling and demographics, because all of the data and all the smart money and all the experts said that Britain would rem vote to remain in the European Union, uh, and we didn't. And so from I can see why that would give heart to Trump people, because they can now say there were shy Brexiteers who wouldn't tell pollsters what they felt, mm. because there was a kind of cultural taboo about saying it in certain you know, high-income, high-education uh, circles, and therefore we've got shy or hidden Trump supporters, and so you can see why they'd be emboldened by that. What about the broader thing, the thing of like the notion of looking, withdrawing from the world stage, yes. of being more isolationist, all the kinds of things you wrote about at the time of Brexit? Yeah, no, so I think the, there is a global phenomenon here. There is a rage against elites. There is a fear that globalization is just, just you know, leaving a whole lots of people who are losing out, and that they are turning on establishments who they feel have failed to protect them from globalization. So all of that would point to success for Trump as riding this kind of Brexit wave. The thing that pushes against it, I think, are the demographics, that Britain, you could win among white working class people and then win. And here, the demographics are different. It's a more diverse society. That, you know, just winning white people isn't going to be enough. You've got your reporter's notebook open here, and there's nothing I'm more tantalized by than what is in Jennifer Jacobs's notebook. What's the most tantalizing fact written on those pieces of pages? Piece of paper. Um, I was asking some of the people at the Cruz thank you party today if they think that Ted Cruz is going to endorse Donald Trump this evening, and they all said, yes, we hear he is going to. And so I was asking people, how do you feel about that and they said we're sad you know we love we love Ted Cruz but we're over it we're moving on and um, some of them were very passionate about it and and I, and I actually said I said do you think there's gonna be a boo in the room because you all just booed when the, the Trump jet flew over and they said no you know we haven't bought a Trump t-shirt or anything yet but we're on board with Trump I think it'll be interesting if it's a kind of technical legalistic endorsement where he just crosses over the formal threshold or whether there's any kind of warmth uh, in that I mean I, I would guess he would err more on the side of the former, he has you know, checked the box of endorsement without showing any love, is what I would guess he would do. Right. Today he was hoping to just give this speech at this thank you party without even mentioning the nominee, just acknowledge, okay, we've got a different nominee, and then change the subject. Then that Trump jet flew right overhead, and hmm. just with that Donald Trump's uncanny ability to just absolutely step on his rivals and, and steal the show. They've got, obviously, other goals here, but Paul Manafort and others have said their main goal is to sort of show people more of what multidimensional about Donald Trump than they knew before. Uh, we're halfway through. Have, we, have you heard anything that gave you think would give people a better sense of him as I a person? I really haven't. I mean, it's interesting. The speeches from his family members have shown them sometimes in a good light. And, you know, Melania, apart from everything that came afterwards, you know, she also performed it quite well. And people, you know, it was quite, she was quite likable. And then Donald Trump Jr., we've said, cut quite a sort of distinguished figure. But I don't think they shed light much on him. So far, the only, you know, telling, humanizing anecdote actually came from Tiffany Trump mentioning that her father wrote sweet little notes on the report card. And that was, that's the sort of thing you normally get in spades, and we just haven't had much of it. So I think they do quite well for themselves. Maybe this is the Trump lesson, you know, look after number one. I'm not sure they really showed or shed much light humanizing that on him. If you came into this thinking he is a pretty sort of, you know, alpha male business guy, you, you still think that. And they haven't given us much else to go on. What do you think? I think that's exactly right. It seemed like Donald Trump Jr.'s speech was very political. It was almost like a stepping stone for his own eventual uh, political future. And I'm not so sure that many of the speeches at the convention so far have appealed so much to people in the middle, those independent voters that they really need to work on. If I was a regular politician who'd come here, even one who had my, made my peace with the Trump nomination, I would be thinking, you know, what, what have exactly has happened here? I am playing second fiddle to this, you know, political version of the Kardashians, where each one of them is getting their moment in the spotlight. They're all doing really 
speak quite well. And we are just looking pallid by comparison. You just see the, the energy in the room. There's no star factor when Senator this and Attorney General that walk on. People are not that interested. And, you know, I'm thinking, I, I'm guessing that they might, would be thinking, I chose a political career. Was going into politics a mistake? You know, with, did I need to find some other route? Because Welcome. these people seem to be doing better. Welcome to the Trump show. <laughs> it's, that's what it's like. Jennifer, Jonathan, thank you both. We'll be right back. Head on over to BloombergPolitics.com right now. You can read more about how Ted Cruz is positioning himself for the 2020 election and his big speech tonight. Next on Bloomberg Radio is First Word Asia on Bloomberg TV. On Bloomberg West, you've got Intel CFO Stacy Smith. We'll be back here tomorrow night from Cleveland to wrap up today and to preview big night Donald Trump's speech tomorrow night, as well as Ivanka Trump's speech, which is getting a lot of buildup. Deservedly so. We'll see you tomorrow night. Same bad time, same bad channel. Sayonara.
I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg West. Let's begin with a check of your first word news. Turkish President Recep Erdogan today imposed a three-month state of emergency following last week's failed military coup. After meeting with cabinet ministers and top security advisors, President Erdogan said the measure was being taken to counter threats to Turkish democracy and wasn't intended to curb basic freedoms. Texas Senator Ted Cruz and Indiana Governor Mike Pence take the spotlight tonight on day three of the Republican National Convention in Cleveland. Senator Cruz has said he has no plans to endorse Donald Trump, who mocked Cruz and his family during the primaries. Trump and Pence are in Cleveland. They'll make their first joint appearance at the convention tonight. Cleveland police say two officers suffered minor injuries when they were assaulted during a flag-burning protest near Quicken Loans Arena. Several arrests were made. The protests briefly made it difficult for convention delegates and reporters to enter the arena. German Chancellor Angela Merkel made it clear there won't be talks about the UK's exit from the European Union until official notification. But she did offer visiting British Prime Minister Theresa May time to decide when her government's ready to invoke the so-called Article 50 notification, something May said she won't do this year. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. Bloomberg West is next. I'm Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg West. Coming up, the tech earnings parade continues. We'll break down numbers from Intel and some other heavy hitters. Plus, an olive branch extended in the brutal battle for ride sharing in China. Investors are pushing for a truce between Uber and Didi. And Spotify pumps up the jam. We'll break down news of an upcoming IPO with the Bloomberg reporter who broke this story. But first, to our lead. Intel reporting earnings that slightly beat analyst estimates. Shares, however, dipping in after-hours trading as much as 3%. The company reported revenue of $13.5 billion, up 3% from the same quarter last year. Net profit of $1.3 billion. That is down 51% year-on-year. The key number to watch, though, the data center business and some challenges Intel is seeing there. Anand Srinivasan of Bloomberg Intelligence is with me from New York. He will be breaking down all the numbers. But first, I want to hear from Stacey Smith, Intel CFO. I spoke to him just moments ago. You know, just relative to the second quarter, we came in right in line on revenue. We actually did a little better in terms of profit from our expectations. When you dissect that revenue, uh, the PC market was a little bit stronger. Data center was right in line, maybe a hair better. Uh, and then that was offset a little bit by weakness in memory and Internet of Things. Sp specific to the PC uh, category, we did see it a little better. We think there was a little less of an inventory burn in the second quarter, but we continue to be cautious as we go into the back half of the year. We're still expecting a high single-digit decline in the PC market. Where do you see the bright spots? Do you see improvement mostly in the U.S.? Does it spread abroad? At the larger picture, I think that the driver of the company right now is what's going on in the cloud and the data center. Uh, and I think we're poised for a strong second half. We have you know, insight into what some of the big cloud customers are looking to purchase. Uh, and we have new products coming in based on 14 nanometer process technology that we think will uh, allow them to buy a richer mix of products. And then within the PC segment, what we're seeing is that you know, it's kind of the same as what we've seen the last six months. The mature markets are doing relatively better uh, than uh, emerging markets. Um, you know, there's some pockets of strength. U.S. retail uh, was a little stronger this quarter than we had anticipated in the back to school season. And so, you know, we're continuing to watch it. Now, there is some concern about the data center business and that this, your most profitable business, won't be able to make up for weakness in the PC market. And this is the second quarter that growth in that unit has actually fallen below 10 percent. Will we get back to that mid-teens type of growth that we've gotten used to? We're predicting uh, double-digit growth for this year, low double-digit growth for this year. That would imply, based on the growth rate in the first half, that you know we have a, a growth rate that's kind of in the mid-teens in the back half. So, so I think we have line of sight. Uh, 
uh, at that level of growth rate. And again, it's it's the buying patterns of some of the large cloud customers, uh, and it's uh, a, a richer product mix. You know, I, I think one of the one of the if I can one of the longer term drivers of the data center is the Internet of Things that you talked about earlier. In, in all of these devices connecting to the cloud infrastructure, you know, just just a data point here. Uh, the data that we look at says in 2020, a person will generate about 1.5 gigabytes of information. A connected car will generate almost 3,000 times that amount of data in a day.